I'm a coach and a speaker. I've been in the area of personal development, self-mastery, self-enrichment, just learning how to live your best life from the physical to the mental, to the emotional, to the relational, to the financial and ultimately spiritual, because that is where our, that is where our happiness lies in our spiritual uh, connection to everything that is greater than ourselves, to contribution, God, the universe, mother earth, father sky, everyone around us. So, but it's all about how can, how can I be better? How can you be better? And looking at all of the areas or the area in your life right now that requires the most attention for you to get that balance back. You know, you're never going to have everything perfect, but our goal in life is to feel good. doesn't matter whether you're, like Chris said, you're a CEO or someone just wanting to get fit. Everyone's goal in life is to feel good and our feeling good is in balance and alignment. So that's what, I, that's what I've done for 17 years, always starting with myself first. And when I find something that works for me, I then feel an obsession to want to share it with other people because why should they suffer if I have a tool that I know can free people in any area of their life or whatever area it is. Now, I've been doing this for a long time. I've spoken all over the world, 16 or 17 countries, represented Tony Robbins. My friend and my coach is Lisa Nichols from The Secret. I've you know, been on stage with Jack Canfield, lots of amazing things. And beginning of last year, my life was going in the right direction. Finally, finally, after trying for so many years. And I was 37 years old and I've done martial arts. I'm an endurance athlete. I'm a plant-based athlete, obviously. Um, and I was like, man, this is going to be my year. And I remember saying to my wife, beginning of 2019, babe, I just know it. This is my year. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to get back into boxing. I think I've still got it. And I, and I got back into boxing. I wanted to see what I could achieve because I always dabbled in it. And of course, when we dabble in anything, we never know how far we can go or how good we can be. So I said, okay, I'm 37. I've got some gray. I've got some silver fox on my beard. So let me try one more year. Jules hates me boxing. I said, just give me one more year. And I went all in and I practiced and I practiced. And my first two fights, I, I won by technical knockout. I mean, they didn't even go the full rounds. The other guy couldn't continue. So I was on a good path. That's what I'm saying here. I was on a good path. And then... I was cycling across the UK for charity. Another thing I love to do, uh, do my very best to be an altruistic leader. And in everything that I do, I try to give back. And I was raising money for a cancer charity because one of my clients lost his 16 year old daughter to cancer and I couldn't just sit there and do nothing. So I cycled across the UK, a thousand miles in 10 days. And I remember on the second day, I, you know that saying, careful what you wish for. <laughs> I remember on the second day saying to my support team that were driving behind me, I said, guys, I feel like my next challenge has to be way bigger than this. Like I can just, I can feel it. Like it has to be huge. Like something I've never faced before. And that was on the second day. And on the eighth day, uh, I was cycling almost at the end of my day, 10 to 12 hours on the bike, starting early morning, finishing in the evening. And we usually finish by 7 p.m. But on this day, we decided to go on a different route because we realized that we were running out of miles. And we knew that we marketed this whole thing on a thousand miles in 10 days. So how could we finish doing 954? So I went like this. Let's go there to North Devon rather than through Devon. And if you've ever been to North Devon before, I hadn't. It is hill of the hill of the hill of the hill of the hill. So seven o'clock, I was still on my bike. And 10 past seven, I was hit going downhill head on by a drunk hit and run driver, disqualified, uninsured, over the limit, four times over the limit. And he just kept on driving. My bike was smashed into pieces. I still have it in a bag and I can't fi fi find myself to, to look at it. I find it in myself to look at it. I was flown off the road, bike smashed all over the road, literally left for dead. Uh, just like hit me and just left me there. Very, very luckily or fortunately, I had a car stop. And the first car to stop was an off-duty paramedic. The next car to stop was an off-duty police officer. The next car to stop was an 
someone that worked in national sea rescue and they had oxygen in their car Pfft. i mean i'm not even religious but i was like man god was watching me that day i'm spending my whole life trying to find out who god is and how god is whether it's a man or a woman or whatever and i was just like i just knew god was watching me because even the doctor said to me after spending two weeks in intensive care, seven weeks in total in hospital, doctor said, man, you are lucky to be alive. I, I broke both of my legs in that accident. I developed post-traumatic amnesia. I don't remember anything for days. I don't remember the accident still to this day, zero memory. I broke both of my legs in multiple places. I have titanium rods, rods in the middle of my bone holding my legs together. I broke my arm, it was wrapped around me. I had a punctured lung, collapsed lung, heart trauma, stomach trauma, bowel trauma. I'm covered in scars, spent a lot of time in hospital. But like I said, I didn't really remember anything. And on about day 10, day 11, I started to remember. And I started to not remember, I started to piece together what had actually happened to me. And that someone hit me head on and left me for dead. And that I almost died and all these things. And in that moment, in that very moment that I was able to put everything together, I was faced with a choice. Like we are in every moment of our life, we're faced with a choice. We're faced with a choice of how to react when the starts are late. Chris was faced with a choice yesterday. Lorraine was faced with a choice an hour ago. And we're always facing choices. And those decisions that we make or those choices that we make are defining the rest of our life. Every moment we are defining our future, starting right now, then the next moment, then the next moment that unfolds is all being created by what we choose. So I knew, like I said, having done this for so many years and accumulated so many self-mastery tools, I knew that I was not going to choose to be a victim. I'm not saying that Whatever someone does to you, they're not hold responsible or accountable. Of course they are. But he, that man that should not have been on the road, that should not have fled from the scene of an accident, even though he knew he hit a cyclist because he said it. A witness said, it, I think I've hit a cyclist when he eventually got out of his car and stumbled all over the road. I know that he can't make me feel what I feel. That is my choice, my responsibility. So in that moment, I knew I have a choice here and I'm going to choose a meaning for this. I'm going to choose this moment to have it make me and not break me. And I went on an incredible journey of self-discovery, reinvention, because I couldn't speak. I couldn't coach. I couldn't be an athlete. I said, hey, if I can't do the outer work, what can I do? Right. Once again, a choice. Are you going to focus on what you can control and what you can't control? And I said, you know what? I can control my inner world. So let me go on a spiritual journey. And I did plant medicine, Dr. Joe Dispenza, advanced retreats, Vipassana, living in silence, living with monks, living in a Shaolin temple, going to a Buddhist monastery in Germany to practice Kung Fu. I did all these amazing things. And over the last year and a bit, I've just rebuilt and reinvented myself. But at the back of my mind, there was always something I knew I needed to work on. And it was this. Have I really, or am I really not blaming the driver? Have I really forgiven the driver? Do I really not have any ill feelings towards him or anger or hatred? And I didn't know because I'm very, I have a very resilient mindset. I can push that shit down. And I knew that I could test myself to see if I'd really forgiven him. And it was at the court case where I would get to face him. Now, I was told by the police, the lawyers, everything, JP, you don't have to attend court. Once again, I was faced with a choice. I could not go or I could go. Which one would benefit me and potentially the driver? Well, going, obviously, because if I don't go, I know nothing will come from it. So I went to the court. And for a lack of time, I'll just share the, the next few parts of the story very quickly. I went to the court. The guy turned up drunk February this year. It didn't happen. They put him in a cell. He came back the next day. He pleaded not guilty. I just did my very best to say, you know what? It is what it is. No one is born a bad person. 
And I practiced always persistence and both patience. So I was persistent to get this sorted and, and, and heal myself, but I was patient in the process. Everything happens at exactly the right time. And a mantra for my life, it is what it is. And it was what it was. So I waited for COVID to be finished. October, yes, we're back in the courtroom. He doesn't turn up to court. The police eventually find him, transport police, on a train somewhere, somewhere else. I don't know what it was called. Intoxicated again. The judge orders, the judge has had enough. They orders him to go and get the guy. They get him. He comes in. They decide he's not in a state to make his plea. So once again, back in prison, cancel my next day, stay in Exeter for to go to the Crown Court the next day. The next day he comes by a police escort. I know he's going to turn up and I know he's going to be sober. So what I do is I stand at the entrance of the courtroom, not to, not to face him or threaten him, to face myself. And I stand at the end of the entrance of the courtroom and as they walk him past me, I'm, I'm like this, I'm like open chested, I'm leaning into the situation because I want to face what I have to heal if there's still something to be healed. I know that I cannot live a free life if I hide away from something or I push it down. So I'm there, I'm ready. He comes past me and I feel nothing but empathy. And I, th I say to myself, that's it. I got what I came for. All of this work that I've been doing, the deep meditations, the tears, the screams, the restless nights, the thinking, the trying to change my being or doing my best to change my being, it all worked because I felt nothing but love for this man. That other people would go straight to judging him. So we get into the courtroom. Once again, I'm faced with a, with a choice. There's a victim statement in a case like this where you have to you have to say what well, the judge has to say everything that happened as a result of this incident. So the judge turns to me and he says, first of all, this man pleads guilty to everything, all of the charges, four or five different charges. I'm like, yes, finally, we can move forward. Progress. And the judge says, Mr. De Villiers, would you like to read your speech? Once again, I'm faced with a choice. Let me tell you, the first thing I thought was no. I don't want to read. It's too uncomfortable. I've got to stand at the front of the courtroom, proper courtroom, white wigs, everything. I've got to face him because now there's a barrier between us where we're sitting. No, I don't want to. I don't want to do it. I've got what I came for. I'm healed. I'm healed. And then I thought, hang on. I'm thinking about me. I'm only thinking about me. So let me be the observer from another perspective and let me look at both him and I. Do I need to read the speech for him and I? For him and me, it's like, yeah, absolutely. Because I'm sure you'd all agree, maybe this has happened to you in your life where one person has said one thing at one time and in that one moment, it's affected the rest of your life. Has that ever happened to you? Just one thing, could be a good, could be bad, it could be bully, a parent, a role model, a friend. And I knew that if I don't share what I wanna share, I know there can be no impact on this man. But if I do have the courage and I can encourage myself to read this, I know that maybe, just maybe, just maybe, just maybe I can get this guy to change his ways. Maybe, maybe, maybe. No guarantees, but I know that there's a guarantee that if I don't do it, I will have no impact. So I get there, I read my speech and it's, you read it in third person with regards to the, the defendant and the accused and you read it to the courtroom. And I read how my business almost went bust, how it affected my mindset, my wellness, my relationship. I almost got divorced because I became a difficult person to be with in recovery. And then I share at the end, but I'd like the defendant to know that I have no ill feelings towards him and that I forgive him. And then I have this thing inside me, no, I, there's more I want to share. So I say, Your Honor, please, can I add something to my speech? And he says, oh, it's not, is it on your paper? No, it's not on my paper. Got to get permission. So I get my lawyer, we go outside, I get permission, I come back in, I stand, I go back to the, the stand, I pull the mic to my face, and this time I turn to the right and I look at him straight in the eyes. And I say, Mr. I believe in my heart that everything happens for a reason. And even though there are obvious consequences and repercussions for what you did to me, I want you to know that I, I forgive you. I hope that you can use this time that you get sentenced in your sentence to heal whatever needs to be healed 
so that you can come out a stronger, better man. And I want to say that I only wish you well. And I'm speaking to him. And as I'm speaking to him, and after reading that speech and everything that happened to me, I've seen his hand go onto his heart. His other hand goes onto his mouth. And you can just see him. He's like in shock. And I finished my speech with my hands on my heart to the guy that left me for dead. And I said, I forgive you. And I have nothing but love for you. And he stands up in the witness box. He comes forward towards the barrier. And he says, Your Honor, please, can I share something? He gets permission from his lawyer. He gets permission. And he says, Mr. De Villiers, I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to hurt you. I've done a lot of bad things in my life and just know that I think about you all the time and your family. I've even called my lawyers numerous times asking about you. And if I could have it the other way, or if I could have it another way, I would have had it be me rather than you. I'm so sorry. And he's emotional. I'm emotional. And it was one of the most powerful, powerful moments of my life. And what was the alternative? To not forgive this man and to never, ever, not just free myself from what had happened, but I wouldn't have given this man any kind of freedom. And I know without any doubt that that man felt lighter as a result of that experience. And that is our purpose, our obligation in the world at least the people in this environment here, it's to shed light in darkness. No one is born a bad person. When I left that courtroom, his lawyer came to me and said, Mr. De Villiers, I just want to thank you. I always get emotional when I share this. He said, I've been a lawyer in court for 25 years. I've never seen what you did. He said, I just had to come and tell you, thank you. That is the power of forgiving to take someone that's just going to their daily job where they're putting people in prison every day for 25 years, for a quarter of a century, to have them moved, to have them touched, them affected, them impacted. Forgiveness is not just about ourselves; It's about everyone that that forgiveness touches. I didn't know, but there was a reporter in the courtroom and it was shared with Devon Live, the main newspaper, one of the main newspapers in Devon. And that thing went viral. A quarter million views over the next week, all over the world. People messaging me saying, thank you, thank you, thank you for what you did. And I'm crying because I'm so grateful that I had the courage to forgive. It takes so much courage to forgive, but not forgiving, to everyone listening here and everything, everyone that you ever share this message with, not forgiving is like trying to swim with an anchor round, with an anchor around your ankle. Not only will it not give you a light life and a, and a happy, graceful life of ease, but eventually after fighting and resisting and keep you know, having to pay attention to that thing, eventually it'll pull you down. And it'll absolutely destroy you. If you want to live a free life, a light life, a happy life, you've got to be willing to let go of every little thing that is upsetting you, holding you down, every little bit of anger and resentment. Like Nelson Mandela said, having anger and resentment is like drinking poison and expecting it to kill your enemy. It doesn't kill anyone but you, and it eats at you slowly, 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 until it's too late and it pulls you down. I'd like to give you a takeaway for practicing forgiveness, and I'm sure most of you know it already. It's called Ho'oponopono, and it's a Hawaiian, a very old Hawaiian practice, which is a mantra, four sentences. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Thank you. I love you. I said it over and over and over before I go to court, before I went to court, because it helped me get into this space to embrace forgiveness. And I promise you, it'll do the same for you. So thank you. And I love you. Thank you for having me here, letting me share my story. I'm very passionate about sharing this. And I look forward to any questions or just being, just being an observer and a listener and listening to everyone else. Thank you, Chris, so much for having me and part of the Wonderman family. And you definitely are my family and I'm happy to be here.